יופי, בעזרת השם. תורה ל"ח ליקוטי מורן, פרט ה', I think we're still in פרט ה'. We talked about the tshuva, we talked about the busha, we talked about that shame that a person feels while he's trying to get close to Hashem Yitbarach. And again and again we can see that that shame is coming especially when you confront yourself, when you stand in front of yourself and, and, and you see your so-called lackings that you have that are really not your lackings. That's, that's who you are. That's the results of, of the exile, of, of your journey, of what that you went through. A person cannot blame himself on who that he is or on what that he went through or if he didn't have the vessels, the tools, the wisdom to act differently than the way that he behaved. If he would have that knowledge, more um, wisdom, so you would act differently, but you had your fears and you had your lack of understanding of the situation and you were young or stupid or whatever and that's who you were in that situation so what can you do with that? What the kid is going to do and not going to sin? How? What? What? By which power? The powers that you achieved today you didn't have them five years ago, ten years ago so you couldn't handle with that situation better <coughs> And even if you think to yourself, no, I could, and all of those executions that people are uh, slaughtering themselves from, for no reason, blaming themselves, no, I could, I thought about it. You didn't have the power. You were scared, you were afraid. You didn't know what to do. The lusts and desires were all over you, overpowering on you. What could you do? It was a lost fight from the beginning. Without Hashem to help you, you cannot beat your Yetzara. Your Yetzara made out of fire, and you have your body that is flesh and bones, and, and, and you cannot change it. You have to accept it. So those scars that you have today, and all of the... That's you. That's who Hashem made you to be. And now, with all of that... You need to come to that decision. I still want to serve Hashem. That's going to show your humility. Because if you serve Hashem only when everything is succeeding, only when you're growing, only when you're developing, so you're not serving Hashem. You actually serve yourself. It's a pleasure for you to serve like that. But when it's hard, and when you look at yourself and you say, it's a long journey in front of me to work on myself and to fix myself and to fix all of what that I ruined until today. But still, I'm going to do it. So that's humility. And then, when you're humble, you can start feel the light of Hashem, the light of the Creator, inside of yourself. Because really, only when a person is humble, then the light of Hashem is going to hover on him, going to glow above him. And gonna let him understand who he really is. It's like a magnet. Kamaim apanim. When you're facing yourself to Hashem, means you believe that Hashem is there, so Hashem is facing to you. And from the other side also, when Hashem is coming toward to you, so you see him and and you're pointing yourselves to each other. You're you you're focusing your your eyesights one to the other, and. And it's a very natural process that there is only one thing that is holding us back and that's our lack of faith in ourselves. That is, it's equal to, to arrogant, to be arrogant. When you don't believe in yourself, it's, it's, it's not real humility. When you say, no, I'm not worthy, I'm not able, that's arrogant. It's not humility at all. When you say, who am I to do that, it, it, it means that you, you want to have more and you think that you deserve to have more because you're sad. 
You say, no, I'm not able to teach. I'm not able to, to, to be rich. I'm not able to, to make my wife happy. I'm... Actually, you're sad now. Why you're sad? Because you say, hey, I, I deserve to have all of those abilities. I, I do need to. Uh, and I don't have it, and I'm sad. That sadness is, is arrogant. The real humble person is always ready to learn. He's always ready to try. Always, even if he's falling, he's standing back on his legs. That's a real humble person. That's why also a humble person will never going to stay in the same level. Because he will always going to seek for the will of Hashem. What does Hashem want for me now? I'm not important. I'm not the center of this world anymore. When you come to that understanding, I'm not the center. I'm just here for him let's see what he needs in that moment you opened yourself to receive his light to receive his wisdom and and to work through that and by that and to be guided by him and by his angels and messengers that are going to come and help you and going to lead you and give you a hand and going to take you to your success but for that like we said before you need to be ready the tests are very interesting because sometimes, like we spoke about it, sometimes the tests are telling you you need to be generous and in the other day you need not to give charity today because it doesn't call charity today to give to that person and you need to learn how to say, no, I'm not giving today. It's not charity at all. And you need to know when you should give more than your abilities and homage to give all of your money. And when you need to say, no, even ten agorot, even one shekel, I'm not giving you that money. It not belongs to you. It's not going to be charity. You're trying to steal that money from me. I'm not giving it. And you need to learn your borders. So a lot of times a person can find himself in tests that are the opposite of all of what that he learned until now. Like Rabbi Nathan said, when I came to that day that I knew all of the tricks of my Yetzirah then the Yetzirah came to me in a different face. You can learn everything and to know everything and then when really you learned it all and you, you graduated, okay, now you're going to come to college, now you're going to come to the second class and in that class you don't know nothing. That's the thing, that's the wisdom, that's the right way. That's exactly how it's supposed to be. That you grow and you develop and you, and you climb from one level to the other and every level it's a different floor, it's a different world. And over there the rules are different and the things that they demand from you and they expect from you are totally different. And one day you need to be soft, and one day you need to be strong, and one day you need to be quiet, and one day you need to stand up and scream and to, and to, and, and, and to shout. One day you need to be humble, and one day your humility is going to bring you to your kingship, to have a crown on your head. That's David Amelech, that is so humble. That's Moshe Rabbeinu, that is so humble. And they are the leaders of Am Israel. The leader, he is humble. How he can be humble? He needs to hold the crown, the throne of honor. He needs to have a, I said, Shavit staff in his hand and to lead the people and to yeah. tell everyone exactly what they need to do. You go do this, you go do that. A humble person talks like that? Yes. Only a humble person can talk like that. Why? Because he doesn't do that for himself. So he's able for you, like Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moshe Rabbeinu was choosing the people according to their abilities. He knew exa exactly which job is fit for every one and one. Why? Because he loved each and every one of them and he knew, listen, just listen. If you're going to do that, it's going to bring you to your purpose. Even, okay, you don't like it. I understand it. But it's for you. It's not for me. I don't need you. That's the wisdom of Moshe. Moshe is coming from a place like that, that he's thinking on his friends. He's thinking what's the right thing for you. And then he can give you the answer what is right for you. He doesn't think what's going to be good for me and that for me it's going to be so good so I'm going to tell you what to do. That's not humility. That's arrogant. That person cannot lead Am Israel 
when for me it's going to be good that you're going to do this and that and only for me it's going to be very useful for me it's not going to last even after five years even after ten years one day you're going to wake up and you're going to say I don't want to work in this place anymore I don't want to stay I don't feel they're respecting me I don't feel that they like me. I don't feel wanted I don't feel it's not my place I want to go and why? only because someone used you violated you for five years, for ten years, depends in, in your Sata Dishmaya. And then you say, I've had it, it's enough, it's too much, thank you. I'm happy on my, on my side, on what that I've done, but on what that you've done, I don't want to stay here, I want to go. But a humble person will never going to do that to you. A humble person will always going to be there for you like Moshe Rabbeinu. And he's going to bring you to your greatness, to your Gdullah. How you achieve that? How you become to be the vessel to be used by Moshe Rabbeinu? How you going to open your ears in a way that you're going to understand what Moshe Rabbeinu is telling you? On that, it's been said on Yahushua Binun, the Yahushua Nar, Lo Yamish Minawel, that he wasn't moving for a breath of a hair from his master, from Moshe Rabbeinu. And it's written on Yahushua another two times, if I'm not wrong, that he was the servant, Mesharet Moshe. He was the servant of Moshe Rabbeinu. So, it might be, and probably was exactly like that, that in the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu, there were Talmidei Chachamim that were a lot, a lot greater mm -hmm. than Yahshua Binun. You don't need to read Midrash for that. It's pretty obvious. It's just... A lot of talented people, a lot of rich people, a lot of very successful people. So... The fact that Yahshua Benun continued Moshe Rabbeinu, he was the fit, the right vessel to continue the light of Moshe Rabbeinu, it's not because of, of, of his talents, because of his abilities, because of his power or wisdom or, or how genius he was. It was because of how much he sacrificed, because of how much he gave from himself, how much he was not moving from the Beit Midrash in Misirut Nefesh to do things to connect himself to his rabbi. Like that he is the only one that is standing and waiting that Moshe Rabbeinu is going to come down from the Mount of Sinai. And he's not moving nowhere because Moshe said he'll come back. I'm waiting. Moshe will come back. When you count on the righteous man, so the righteous man is with you. Rabbeinu said, Give me your heart and then I'm going to lead you in a new path. You have to give the heart. If you're not going to give the heart, Rabbeinu cannot take you to that new way. For Rabbeinu HaKadosh, it's easy to take you, but it all depends on you. That is exactly what that Moshe Rabbeinu is saying to Am Yisrael. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu told them, shoel mimchem. What am I asking you to do? Kim ah, only to be believers, to, 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 to fear for me, to have faith in me. So they're asking on Moshe Rabbeinu, is it a small thing, Moshe Rabbeinu, that you're asking for Mam Israel to, to be very strong in faith? It's a hard thing. Not every person can achieve that. So why are you saying that? Why are you telling them? So why, why are you demanding and you're telling Am Israel, hey, that's a simple thing. Believe in Hashem Barach with all of your heart. What am I asking you to do? It's, it's such a big deal. Yes, Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe Rabbeinu, he, the, over there, I don't remember who is the Mepharesh that is answering that, but one of the Chachamim, one of the wise people over there, the Mepharshim, are saying that to Moshe it was an easy thing. For Moshe it was an easy thing to commit himself 100% to Hashem, so this is why he's coming and telling all of Am Israel, what am I asking you to do? To be like me? So it makes that question even harder. Because now the question on Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, you know how hard you worked and that you achieved a huge level to be so different than the people. So how you even think to yourself that they're able to achieve what that you achieved? You know how hard it was for you and how much Siata Dishmaya you had that you achieved all of that. So why are you even 
expecting them to have that chance, that ability to achieve your level, to become, to be like you. Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, for me, it's a small thing. For you, it's a small thing. Okay, I think, okay, we can understand. But what about us? It makes life even harder for us to become, to be like you. That's actually what you're asking from us. So I heard that answer from Rav Shalom that he said that Moshe Rabbeinu is saying to the people, but you have me. You have me. I achieved it. This is why it's a small thing for me. And if you will just going to connect yourself to me, I can give it to you because for me it's a small thing. So Moshe Rabbeinu is not arrogant. He's there for the people. He's saying to them, look what I achieved. You don't see on me that I achieved it. You do. Okay, great. So he's not dividing himself from them by saying that. He's actually connecting. He's telling them, and you are my students, and I can give it to you, and that's my will. So why are you not taking? What's the problem? Come and take. Because how much that you're going to be able to receive from your rabbi, from the one that is mashpia, give to you, depends on how much that you're going to come to take, how much that you're going to commit yourself to him with all of your heart, to aim yourself to his will, and you and him together are going to aim your will to the will of the tzaddik of the generation. And the tzaddik of the generation, with you all, going to aim his heart to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that's it. And it depends in each and every one of you. Moshe Rabbeinu, it's true, the Torah is praising him on how that he born and came to the world. But we see that also there were other righteous people that did it came, didn't came from the same pure place like that it's written on Moshe Rabbeinu that he born uh, circumcised, mahul, and that the house was illuminating and on and on. There is a big midrash, a long midrash that Rav Ovadia Yosef told that midrash to Rav Shalom and told him on that, that it's written on, uh, on uh, um, no, I was wrong. It's a different midrash. Wow, that's amazing midrash. Some other time. The midrash that Rav Ovadia Yosef told Rav Shalom, it's an amazing midrash. I think I told you that once. But that's a different midrash. And in that Midrash, so Moshe Rabbeinu is testifying in front of a certain king that actually he had all of that bad attributes, bad midot, and he was about to fail in all kinds of sin and everything, but he worked on himself for years and years and years until that he stood up back on his legs and, and he became to be pure. And he said that now Yetzirah cannot touch me anymore because he came to that level that he, he cleaned himself. So Moshe Rabbeinu himself, even he was mm. about to sin. On Yosef HaTzadik, we saw that he was about to sin, that he was in a huge test, and without that Siat Dishmaya, without that help from heaven, that, that Yaakov, his father, came and, and saved him in a certain way, he wouldn't, he wouldn't succeed so much. So he had his Siat Dishmaya. And Avraham Avinu he came from the horrible family. The, his father was a black magician and was doing horrible things, like kishuf and black magic. And, and from that place he came. And David Amelech grew up between the animals in the pen. And over there he lived his life for years and, and he was struggling and people blamed him on so many things and chased after him. And you see that those people still grow. So you see that the family, it's not what it brings you, your talents, your wisdom, it's not what it brings you to achieve the levels in the Avodat Hashem. What it brings you closer to Hashem, it's how much you will be in that aspect of Yeshua Binun, Yeshua Nar, that he holds himself as a young kid. He holds himself, who am I? He's not Yeshua Talmid Chacham. Why are you saying that he was Nar, that he was just a young kid? That's how he holds himself. When Rabbi, Nach, when Rabbi Nathan, once, um, one of the first times, he wanted to be with, with Rabbeinu, with Rabbi Nachman in uh, Purim, in Kirat Megillah, he wanted to read the Megillah with, with Rabbeinu, and so he had to make a certain journey to the city that Rabbeinu was staying in that city, and, and he couldn't come in the right time, and, and so he had to read the Megillah, in a different village, in a different city. And then, during the night, after they read the Megillah, he went to the city that Rabbeinu was there 
and he wanted to read the Megillah in the morning with him and to spend Chag Apurim with him together. When he came, he came very late at night, after that Rabbeinu already finished reading the Megillah, and he himself also finished reading the Megillah. And he looked for the Bet Knesset, he looked for the place to put his head. And he saw that there is a light in the Bet Knesset. He knocked on the door, and the helper, the Shamash of Bet Knesset, opened the door for him and told him, Welcome. He said, well, Who are you? What are you doing here? He said, I'm looking for a big righteous man, grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Nachman Ibrasev. So that helper of the Bet Knesset asked him, He told him, Are you Nathan Yoshua? So he told him, No, I'm just Nathan. So he said, Rabbi Nachman, your rabbi, he said that my student, Nathan, that he is Yeshua, he is about to come, he's going to join us soon. So Rabbi Nathan started to laugh. So I asked him, why are you laughing? So he said, my name is Nathan. And the reason that Rabbeinu is calling me Yeshua is because that he doesn't want me to be part of that group of people that are arguing with him, Mikata Cholkim. He's trying to save me from arguing with him, that I won't fight with him. That's why he's calling me Yoshua. That's the humility of Rabbi Nathan. Rabbi Nathan, you've just been called Yoshua. They said, Rabbi Nathan, you're Yoshua. And what you see, Rabbeinu is protecting me. Rabbeinu is trying to protect me that I won't be from one of those people that are fighting with him. Are you? He's not holding himself as nothing. He's so humble that he feels, I, I'm nothing, I'm zero. I'm just not here, I'm just, a, I'm Nathan. But Rabbeinu is protecting me, Rabbeinu is helping me. Only after that Rabbeinu passed away, only after something longer than a year, he took to Rabbi Nathan to wake up. And he said, I saw that no one else in this generation from the students of Rabbeinu remembers the conversations and the words of Rabbeinu like that I do. He saw it after a year. It took him a year to hear the students talking nonsense about Rabbeinu. Another time mistake here, another mistake there, another something wrong over there, another guy that didn't cut Rabbeinu, didn't catch Rabbeinu at all, another person that was talking for him is arrogant. And, and he heard and heard and heard and, 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 and then he remembered, oh, and also Rabbeinu testified on me that I'm the only one that really got something about him. So, okay. And it took him one year and a half to wake up after that Rabbeinu passed away. Only because of his... Humility, but that humility was, was wrong. Because if you were strong from the beginning, you would understand, okay, it's time to, it's time to work. It took him a certain time to recover from that sorrow, horrible sorrow that he had that Rabbeinu passed away. So like we said before, the thing that it all depends in how much you can receive from the righteous man from the righteous people and from your closeness to Hashem and to Torah and to righteous people depends in how much you're going to be in the aspect of a servant of a Mesharet, Yeshua Binun Mesharet Moshe. How much you're going to commit yourself to whatever they're going to tell you, to as much as they're going to throw you forward, you're going to run. I remember that Rav Shalom was talking um, for years, he's talking about going, giving classes, from the beginning, I just heard him saying that we need to go and give classes. I went to do class. I went to teach, and and that's it. And I started, and already from the beginning, it it went out very well, very nice. So people listened, and I was. You, I, you cannot compare the knowledge that I have today and the ability that I have today to talk to the ability that I had nine or ten years ago. And I was already going to Ramat Gan and to Petach Tikva and going and making classes and talking to people and, and talking from uh, my igno ignorance, from, from, from my lack of... And, but I was... When you hear that there is something and you feel, all right, that's the path, that's the way, let's do it. You need to throw yourself into the fire, into the water, with no fear, with no w worries. Because when you're going to wait for Moshe, so you, you're going to meet Moshe. Actually, the only one that met Moshe was Yeshua. No one else met him. No one really knows where, uh, what happened between Moshe and Yeshua. Only, only Yeshua. Only Yeshua, he really knows. When... I can tell you on so many conversations and, and, and words that I, I received and I heard from Rav Shalom that, that 
that I heard them only because that it was middle of the night, that I heard it only because that he just woke up, that I, I heard them only because that I knocked at his door at 11.30 at night, I mean, Motzei Shabbat, that no one else was there to, to hear what that he had to think and to say. And then I remember that once I came to his house and, and uh, his uh, son-in-law was there, and he was sitting on the sofa, they have a big sofa in the living room, and he told me, come sit, and he's sitting on the sofa, and his son-in-law is sitting on a chair in front of him, and he says, come sit, and I'm, I'm supposed to sit with him on the sofa. And it's a, a big, comfortable sofa, you, I'm about to throw myself like that on the sofa, to, and, and, and to lean back with Rav Shalom on his sofa. I told him, I'm not able to do that. So he said, why, why, you want to ask, come, sit. And I, yeah. I slowly, slowly went down to sit. And he's looking at me and he said, ma, 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 schut. what's the merit that you have that, that, you, that you're sitting here like that with us? Ma schut sheyesh lecha sheviat cha lepor kacha l'shevet itano. So I told him, mitzvot, Good deeds, uh, I'm not sure that because of that, but I'm coming from a very long distance. <laughs> I'm coming from a far place, <laughs> from a very far place. <laughs> so he started to laugh, thank God. And uh, I asked him once, I told him, Rav, tell me please, how can it be when I look at my brothers and I have two elder brothers and I know that they are better than me. I know their hearts, I know those people, very sweet, amazing, wise, gentle, polite people. How can it be that they don't have even 1% of what that we have? Really, they don't have that. They can be the nicest people in the world, but they don't have that. They don't know that Hashem is here. They don't understand how much Hashem is here and how much you, you should commit yourself. They don't live religious life. They don't live a life of purity. And I asked Rav, I told him, how can it be that there are people that we know for sure that they are so great and so amazing and, and, and they're not receiving what that we receive every day? So he said, again he started to laugh, mm -hmm. and he said, to say that we are better than them, for sure we cannot. And it is written that Rabbeinu is helping the worst ones. So probably that's the answer, that he <laughs> just... Took us because we're the worst. It's like Chas Shalom, after uh, in a in a in a battlefield in a, in a war zone. It's a, after a big accident, uh, the paramedics, the, the the doctors that are coming, they check first of all who needs the the say, Shana, who, who's the most injured, and and they, they who now talking about his life. Who in three months is going to commit suicide, going to kill others with him, going to take five people? Who, who is the one that's going to jump from, from the building? Who is next? Okay. Okay, so you're going to come from L.A., no problems. <laughs> okay, you, you, they saw, you're about to crash. Okay, let's take him. Okay, another one before of an X. Okay. And that's how Rabbeinu is there. Is healing slowly, slowly. You see people outside. There are people that are holding on, and you know, I know. I wouldn't hold on. I wouldn't survive for sure. Um, I would make a big noise before I would disappear <laughs> in the smoke. <laughs> Who would survive? Who can survive in this world? For sure, not us. So I had to. What is the but that's the uh, Ravavadia. Midrash. It's amazing Midrash, it's amazing, it's really, it's an amazing Midrash. I told you that once, um, that there was, a, there was a king that he had a friend, that uh, that friend was also a king. So the other, the other king, he wanted to, to send a gift to his king friend. And he said to himself, what am I going to send him? Gold, he's got uh, everything that I can send him, a green Lamborghini, he's got everything. Uh, what, what can I send him? Everything in, uh, I can think about, he's got. So he sent his advisors to think what, what that king doesn't have. And they checked and they saw that they doesn't have lions 
in that kingship, in that, in that land. They don't have lions. So he went and he chose the most perfect um, lion cub and uh, baby lion and male nice and took him, put him in a golden cage and sent him, you know, with a nice uh, curtains covered and they sent that baby cub to the, to the king. And the king opened the gift and he saw a lion and that's it, Mama, she was so <coughs> happy. He said an order, then the, the, the center of the city, they're going to build a huge cage over there and the lion is going to become to be the symbol of their city and everyone that's going to come to the city is going to see the lion and everyone going to be so proud and he was so proud. Now he, and they were feeding that lion, there was a certain person that he was... A, a, a trainer, he was coming and feeding the lion every day and taking care, and that, all of the city, everyone were happy. One day, that uh, trainer, he forgot to lock the door at night when the lion was already big, and the lion went out from the cage and terrorizing the, the people, and that's it, everyone in the houses and all of the soldiers are ready for work, what are we doing? Yeah. So the general, uh, went to the, spe of the special forces of the king, he hold, takes all of the strong soldiers, tells them, listen, we have a mission, we need to bring back the lion into the cage, but we're not allowed to shoot him, we're not allowed to scratch him, we're not allowed to do no damage. It's the, it's the si symbol of the, of the, of the city, it's, a, it's the most uh, important thing for the king in the world. It, we cannot, so who is the soldier that is able to go and bring the lion without a scratch? All of the special forces, no one knows what to do. You cannot bring the, no one is able to do that. So he said, all right, the general is saying, okay, if you're not able to do that, so I'm going to call my son. And he's whistling, he's whistling, and suddenly his son, 14 years old kid, coming with his short pants and tank top. Yes, father, what do you need? He was just jogging outside in the streets, no, fearless. Told him, okay, my son, I need you to go bring the lion. Okay, but don't scratch him, nothing. Uh, yes, father, and he's going. After 20 minutes, he's coming, holding the lion just like that on his shoulder, putting him back in the cage, locking, and the lion is healthy, and everyone are happy, and it's a celebration, and the good news, and CNN, and CBS, the lion is back in the cage. A party, one-week party, and the king is celebrating, everyone are celebrating. And during that party, the king is calling the general, shakes his hand, says, Imeshar Koa, thank you very much, I really appreciate who is the warrior that brought the lion back to the cage? So he said, uh, it's my son. You know, All right, call him to the stage. I, I want to shake his hand. I want to give him a, a gift to honor him, to thank him in public. So again, he's calling his son, that 14 years old kid, come with his uniform now. And he's start to climb the steps uh, to, to, to the stage. And in the middle of the way, he meets his father. His father, his father is looking at him, put his hand on his shoulder and hold him back. So the kid is looking at his father, the kid is looking at his father and the father is twisting his hand like that and he sees he's got a scratch. And he tells him, the father tells the son, where you got that scratch from? So you see the kid becomes to be pale and he's so embarrassed, he doesn't know what to do with himself. He takes his head down like that, wants to be buried mumbling something with his mouth, the father asked him, where you got that scratch from? So, he tells him, from the lion. In that moment, the father slaps his son, just like that, into his face, breaks his face, boom, and the kid is flying in the stairs, dropped on the floor, crashed on the ground, that's it. So the king is calling the, the general, tells him what happened, so he said, my son, he, he was scratched by the lion. <laughs> so he told him, and so you don't... So he said, it's a big shame for our family that he's so, how you say, not cautious, no, ca yes. careless. He told him, listen, 
I respect you. Everything is okay. You're amazing. Your son's amazing. He's 14 years old and he brought that king, that, that lion alone. No one else of the soldiers was able to do something like that. Well, you don't over feel that you're overreacting a little bit. So the general told him, with all due respect, mighty king, there are things that you don't know about my past that maybe if I'm going to explain to you a little bit more, they're going to clarify the picture. So he told him, all right, what's, what's, what's happened? So he said, before I was your general here, you maybe don't know that, but I was the head of a, a, a gang, and, and we were robbing people in the streets, in the intersections, and, and that was our living. And we were killing a lot of people, and, and no one could beat us. We were the strongest group in uh, gang, in the, in the, and, and no one could beat us. One day, in one of the crossroads, we met another gang standing in front of us. So we told them to move away from the way or that we're going to kill them all. And they said, no, you're going to move to the side. And there was a battle, a fight between us, and we were fighting for two weeks. And we couldn't beat them and they couldn't beat us. We were equal. For two weeks we were fighting over there and we couldn't win. So after two weeks we made a break. And we said to ourselves that the head of that gang and the head of that gang are going to fight between themselves. And the gang is going to rest. And the one that's going to win, so the other group going to join them. We're, we, they started to appreciate each other. And so me and the other gang leader, we were fighting for another two weeks. And we couldn't win. We were fighting and fighting. One time I'm, I'm, I'm winning, one time he's winning. And for two weeks and, and there was no, no victory over there. So after two other weeks like those, we, we went to rest a little bit. And during that rest, that leader took off his armor, his mask from his face. And we saw that it was a woman. And it was a big shame for me that I was fighting for two weeks, for four weeks, we're fighting with the woman, and, and that, that woman, she, we, couldn't, we couldn't win. But we realized that it was all from heaven, and that it meant to be like that. And we got married, and the son that you see here, he's the son of me and her, of her and me. So he's a hero, he's a very big hero, that son. And it's a big disgrace for a child of, of two heroes like that to be scratched from a lion. And that's the Midrash. It's a long Midrash that Rav Ovadia Yosef told Rav Shalom. And then Rav Shalom said those words. He said, You are the son of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Those are your ancestors. And you don't appreciate yourself. Everything that happens to you when you fall to sadness and you start to whine, you need to be slapped like that. Boom! How you let those things hurt your feelings so much and push, push you into sadness, into depression, not to be able to function. It's a disgrace for you. You need to be a hero. You know from which tree you're coming, from which honorable family you're coming. Who are your ancestors? That's the conclusion, that's the maskanav of Shalom from that story. It's an amazing conclusion. And I said on that, from an orange tree, apples cannot come, cannot grow. If you are from the seed of Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Ve'le'ah, you have something good inside of yourself. You have things inside of yourself that can be exactly like Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Ve'le'ah. That's you. You're exactly like them. Once when there was a person that came to, I don't, I'm not sure if it was Rabbi Nachman himself or Rabbi Nathan, I think it was to Rabbi Nathan, I'm not sure though. And when Rabbi Nachman or Rabbi Nathan, they were telling about Avraham Avinu, and one of the students said, Oh, how can you have a heart like Avraham Avinu? So I, I don't, I'm not sure if it was Rabbi Nathan or Rabbi Nachman. He looked at him and he told him, you have the exact same heart as Avraham Avinu, but 
but אתה צריך ללבב אותו, but you, you need to make it work, you need to make your heart work. You, you have the same heart. You have the heart of Abraham Avinu, what, 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 what do you need to... You're the CEO, what, probably your name is Avram, right? <laughs> you have the heart of Abraham Avinu. Well, which heart can you have? That's it, second Midrash. Thank you very much, Chazak Baruch. Yeah.